Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston International Space Station, yes, ready for the event. TELUS World of Science, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Frank Florence from the TELUS World of Science Edmonton. How do you hear me? Frank and the TELUS World of Science and everybody in Edmonton, hello. This is Chris Hadfield on the International Space Station. I read you loud and clear. Chris, I tell you, we got a bunch of people here really excited about speaking with you today and a whole group of students ready to ask you their most fundamental questions about you and what you've done for Canada. We're all just very happy and proud of you and Canada and the Canadian Space Agency. I think without me talking any further, we're going to actually have our students come up here and actually speak to you and uh, ask you some of their very profound questions. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm in grade 9. How has your life on board the space station been different from your life on Earth? Uh, Megan, it's, um, it's similar. I, uh, life is busy. I'm sure it's busy for you. It's very busy as an astronaut. But there are a couple big differences here. Here it's, it's not only busy, but it's magic. Because I, I can just do this if I feel like it. And I can stand on the wall. And so, so you suddenly can do things that just are impossible on Earth. And that layer of magic makes life very different, the way you move and the way you even think about moving. And then the other thing that's different is uh, right now we're in the darkness, but what you can see when you float over to the window, Megan, it's, I mean, you could just glance out the window and see all of Europe. Or when you're over top of Edmonton, you can see all the way to, uh, to southern Ontario and all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And you get to see the whole world and start thinking of it, because we go around it in 90 minutes, you think of it as one place. So it's a busy life, which is like being on Earth, but it's then there's this added layer of magic and, and wonderful beauty out the window. So it, it's, it's like life, only um, magnified and, and uh, glorified. It's wonderful. My name is Anne Germain and I am in grade 9. Did being in the Royal Canadian Air Force affect your becoming an astronaut? And if so, how? Hi, Anne. Um, yes, it did, of course. Astronauts uh, generally need to have three things. Number one, you need to be fit and, and be able to pass a really hard physical exam. Number two, you need to have an advanced education to prove that you can learn complicated things. And number three, you have to have proven that you can make good decisions when it matters. And so the Canadian astronauts have come from all different backgrounds, medical doctors, engineers, um, physicists. But I chose to be an engineer, a pilot, and a military pilot. And it really helped me in all three. I've not gotten fat. I've, I've kept my body OK all through life. I um, went to university, three different universities, to get an undergraduate and graduate degrees. And the Canadian Air Force helped me with all of those um, financially and giving me the time to study. And then making good decisions when consequences matter. You know, in order to command a spaceship, you want someone who's proven their ability to do that. And so operating complicated machinery, my country trusting me to defend them as necessary, um, and being a test pilot, I think, really helped get me there. There's lots of different ways to achieve your dreams, but the particular path that I chose worked for me, and, and it's one that's open to all Canadians. Hello, my name is Ayla. I'm in grade 9, and my question for you is, do astronauts ever get sick or ill aboard the ISS? Ayla, when we first get to space, we feel sick. Your body's really confused. And so, you know, you're dizzy, your, your lunch is floating around in your belly because you're floating, and, and your, your, what you see doesn't match what you feel. So you want to throw up. So how do you throw up if you get sick in space? Ooh, the sun's starting to come up. Um, so here's an astronaut barf bag right here. So let's say you're about to throw up in space. Quick, you get your barf bag open. And now think about what happens on Earth when you throw up. Now that'll be okay. You, uh, you throw up and you have a bag of something horrible and then you throw it away. But in space, 
if I throw up in this bag, what am I going to do with it? This bag has to stay with me in space for months. So we want a really good barf bag. So we have one that, uh, that will really protect us. And this one has a, uh, has a liner in it so that when you throw up into it, so that when you throw up into it, you can clean your face off, and then you can push everything inside, and then it comes with its own Ziploc to clean, put inside the Ziploc, and then you can throw it down into the wet trash. So yes, astronauts do occasionally get sick in space, but um, we have special uh, barf bags to deal with it. I'm just going to close the shutter because it gets a little bright behind me. Next question. Hi, I'm Ashley, and I'm in grade 9, and my question is, how does being in space for so long affect your body? Uh, it affects us a lot of different ways. Um, it, uh, it, it affects your bones, your muscles. But one of the ways that we're learning recently is it affects your vision. We don't understand why, but it makes some people's vision worse. And we're studying it and trying to figure it out. So we have a lot of new equipment on board just to test and understand our vision. One of the things we have is a tonometer. This, um, this is actually a, like a pressure gauge that you touch to your eyeball. We put drops, just, it's weird to put drops in your eyes with no gravity. You sort of touch the little drop thing to your eyeball. It spreads over your eye. And then one of the other astronauts will just tap the center of my eyeball really carefully uh, about 10 times. And this lovely little tonometer will figure out the pressure inside my eyeball. That's one way to measure our eyes. Another is to look into the back of them. And so we put those drops in your eyes that dilate your eye, and then I actually put this up against my eye and plug this into a computer, and then I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at the, my eyeball while I'm doing it, and we could take photographs and videos of the optic nerve, and, or at least where it comes into my eyeball, and the veins and, the, and the, the stuff that's inside my eye. So we can do it that way, and then also, we actually do ultrasounds of our eyeballs. And that's in order to see how our eyeballs are changing, what's going on with the optic nerves. And so we have a full ultrasound machine on board, but we don't need gel. You just put a ball of water in your eye, and then you touch the ultrasound to your eyeball, or just to the water above your eyeball, and move it back and forth. And with that, we can see our whole optic nerve. We can see the, uh, the lens and the cornea and everything in beautiful resolution. It's something we've just started doing, and we have experts on the ground who are helping us do it. But with all of these things, we're trying to figure out how the human body works and what controls vision and how it changes when you take away something as simple as gravity. We're learning more about eyeballs, but we're also learning more about how to stay in space permanently. So if you go to Mars, you won't show up there uh, with, with, uh, with bad vision. Hi, uh, Josh, grade 10. Are there any items you are using, currently using on the ISS that you think might become added to the list of NASA spin-off technologies? Oh, yes. I mean, the space station is a laboratory with 100, more than 100 experiments running. Uh, Chris Cassidy is running experiments right now um, of how f solids burn so we can better understand extinguishing and the actual process of flame itself when you take away convection. Uh, there's a Canadian experiment running right down here right now that that is looking at nanoparticles and how they form and, and meld together when you take away gravity. So we understand fundamental tiny uh, particle processes. But I think one of the coolest is this one here, which is called Microflow, which is a Canadian invention that is like a blood analysis machine in a little tiny box. And the, in, right now you have to go to a hospital to get a full blood work done. But this, which just came up a, a month or so ago, um, can take blood samples and analyze them using laser light, and within just a few minutes, um, give me a, a sense of what, what, the, um, what the health of my blood is. And you could also use it for analyzing other liquids. And so think about what all this could do all across Canada, where in a remote community, you don't have to fly someone to the hospital, or you don't have to have a big hospital staff in a small small town, but in fact, this type of machine could help people analyze their blood right close to where they are. So there, there's all kinds of stuff going on board, and Canadian inventions are right in the thick of it. 
Hi, my name is Antonio Grenine. How is working with all the other astronauts aboard the space station like? Does language pose a problem? Um, thanks for the question. We, we try not to have language pose a problem, and the way we deal with it is by uh, studying for years beforehand. When I got hired as an astronaut, I, I hardly knew any Russian at all. I do like da, niet, and sputnik, uh, but, and Soviet. You know, I, I didn't know any Russian words. Um, but we started cooperating with them. And just uh, three years after I was chosen as an astronaut, I went to the, help build the Russian space station. So for the last 20 years, I've been learning Russian. And for me, languages, uh, I mean, the more languages you learn to speak, the more people you can communicate with and try to understand. So we focus on each other's languages. And on board, we uh, have French language, uh, a little bit of Chinese, a um, little bit of Spanish, English, and Russian right now. And mostly we just work in English and Russian. And I speak uh, passable Russian. Uh, the Russians speak passable English, and it works out fine. But it's like anywhere. Even if you speak the same language, sometimes it's hard to communicate. The important part is to try and really listen to what the other person's saying and, uh, and really pay attention and make sure that you're understood. Hey, I'm Tanya, and my question is, when you're wearing a space suit and you're wearing and you are outside of the station, can you feel the sun warming you like on Earth? Oh, you sure can. Yeah, it, it's 150 degrees Celsius out there, 150 C in the sun. So it, you know, it's, it's 50 percent hotter than boiling water. So when the sun comes on you, it's like the worst day where you walk out in the summer sun and it's right on your bare skin. It is really hot. Your suit gets hot. We actively cool the suit. We pump cool water. In, we have uh, special clothing like, like a liquid-cooled long underwear to cool us up there um, because otherwise you couldn't take the heat. It's, uh, it's a wickedly hot sun. And, and there's no air to, to blend it. It's just blaring, glaring right on top of you directly from the sun. Yeah, it's hot. Hi, it's in grade nine. What kind of games or activities are most common among the crew during free time? Uh, you know, we work a lot. Um, and when we don't have work to do, a lot of the time we just go to the window because the world the world is more beautiful than you can imagine, more beautiful than I can imagine. I'm looking at it all the time. It, it's constantly being revealed to you, and they'll, they'll angle with the light and the weather and everything changes, so it's different every time. So that's one of the things we do. Uh, we're playing Scrabble. We have a Scrabble game going up on the roof or the ceiling of, uh, of one of the modules. And, uh, and a lot of people are musicians as well. And Tom and I both are musicians, and, and Pavel Vinogradov in the Russian segment. So we have a guitar and a ukulele and a keyboard on board. And so uh, a lot of the time, in our spare time, we, uh, we play music. So there's no shortage of things to do. And when you have the world at your window, um, it, it, uh, it, geez, it's even hard to go to sleep at night. I'm Megan from grade 8, and I was wondering what do stars look like from outer space? Megan, they look a lot like they do from Earth, except there's no air, no atmosphere, no particles of water droplets or anything in the way. So they're crystal clear. Um, they're hard to see because we're inside with the lights on. So in order to see the stars, because it, it never gets night inside. So you have to shut all the lights off and let your eyes adjust big so you can see them. But when you do, it's like if you go out way outside of Edmonton, way way out in dark, maybe maybe north up towards, uh, I don't know, up towards uh, Fort McMurray or somewhere or halfway up there or Grand Prairie and get way out where it's dark and then let your eyes totally adjust on a beautiful crystal clear cold night. And that's sort of what it's like, where the Milky Way looks milky and where the stars are so pure. And they don't twinkle because there's no air making them oscillate and twinkle. So they're like tiny, perfect points of light. It's beautiful. Hi, I'm Charlie in grade 9. And I was wondering what the biggest goal you're hoping to achieve by being in space is. Kylie, it's to increase human understanding. 
and also human opportunity, those two things. Um, you know, we can only live the lives we live because of the inventions and the understanding that our parents and our grandparents and the people before them figured out. So to be able to push back human capability and knowledge, that's one of the main goals. The other is to let other people have this opportunity. When I was uh, eight or nine years old, it was impossible for a Canadian to fly in space, and there was no space agency, no program, and it wasn't until I was in university before the first Canadian flew in space. Now, a Canadian's commanding a spaceship. So that process of making things more possible for Canadians, that's one of my goals as well. Hi, I'm Rebecca from grade nine, and I was wondering what you missed most about Earth while you were in space. Uh, well, Rebecca, I guess I miss the close human contact. You know, you, I, I don't have family here to give a hug to and, and such, you know, so you, you kind of, it's a little bit isolated. But the other thing I really miss is a hot shower. You know, up here, you can't have a shower, of course. The water wouldn't have anywhere to go, and we don't have that much water. So we just take sponge baths. Um, and that being able to stand under a hot shower and, and have it beat on your body, that's, that's a nice uh, visceral feeling. So uh, I miss physical contact and a hot shower. Hi, my name is Connor, and I'm in grade 9, and my question is, how do you sleep in space? Connor, um, we have to choose what time of day, so we choose um, English time, like Greenwich time in London, England, and then when it, because we had to choose some time, and that's halfway between Moscow and, um, and Houston, where our mission, main mission controls are, so, so we kind of split the difference. But when it's time to go to sleep, you get your sleeping bag, here's mine, and you can see it has strings hanging from it, so I'm just going to show you what it's like to climb into a sleeping bag in weightlessness, and then I'll talk to you again. Maybe I'll be able to yell at you while I'm talking. So you, uh, you just get yourself nice and stable, and you float down into your sleeping bag. Zip it up, put your arms through the armholes so that you don't get completely hampered when you're inside. And then you just tie it on those four little strings on the back to the wall. And then when you want to go to sleep, you just relax. And you can relax, you can relax every muscle in your body. Uh, your head tips forward, your arms float up, and your legs float up, and you can just drift off beautifully to sleep. You, you don't have to roll over, and, and you don't get a, a hot spot you know, on your shoulder, and, and you don't need a pillow because you don't have to hold your head up. So sleeping in space is uh, beautifully relaxing with every muscle uh, completely relaxed until you wake up the next morning. Um, all you need to do is just tie yourself to the wall so you don't float away and bump into something. Hi, I'm Cole from grade nine. What were or are your greatest fears about being in space? My greatest fear is not knowing what I'm doing. Uh, one, because you know I should know what I'm doing, especially if they trust me to command the spaceship. But number two is because if I don't know what I'm doing, it might kill me or, or kill other people. I mean, there are places in the spaceship where if you turn one valve, uh, the space station starts losing its pressure out to space. So you want to know how everything works. So my biggest fear is being incompetent. And so that's why I spent so long training and getting ready so that by the time I got here, I would not only understand everything, but I would have the confidence about it. Like, like writing an exam where you're sure that you know every answer because you've studied and put in the work beforehand. And then you're not fearful anymore. Commander Hadfield, on behalf of all the students and participants here at the TELUS World of Science Edmonton, we would like to thank you for speaking with us today, and we wish you a safe and successful mission. Well, thank you.
Thank you very much. It's been great talking to you. Everybody uh, enjoy the day. And I know there's some specialists from the Canadian Space Agency there to answer questions for you as well. So bye-bye, and I look forward to my next trip to Edmonton. See ya. Thank you. The station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, TELUS World of Science Station. We are now resuming uh, operational comm, and I have one thing for you, Chris, when you're ready.